What have you learned from startups that you couldn't have learned anywhere else? You build for the situation you're in at that moment. You don't have to build the perfect thing from, from the beginning. If you try to do that, that's actually a mistake because you don't mm -hmm. know if it's valuable to the market. Mm -hmm. You don't know how long it will probably take or what it would take to maintain. There's too many unknowns. My manager was able to very clearly articulate what were the things I was missing to make the jump to senior data scientists. And such as, one, such as, <laughs> and I think, I think the key thing was moving away from being task based to actually coming up and um, organizing your own projects. Mark Freeman, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on the program. Where in the world are you calling in from? Hey, John, super, super excited to, <laughs> to be here. Um, calling from San Francisco Bay Area, uh, specifically Pacifica, which is by, by the coast, uh, uh, 15 minutes away from SF. Uh, 15 minutes from San Francisco, and yep. you can walk out onto the beach. Isn't that right? That is correct. Uh, with with COVID, uh, you know, the apartment prices dropped really low. And so, uh, you know, there was some uh, beyond the pandemic being rough and being laid off at one point. The highlight is I got this really nice apartment for cheap and they gave us all these bonuses to move in because they couldn't get anyone to move in and been thoroughly enjoying this. But the other downside, though, is that my apartment's very small. I'm in my closet <laughs> <laughs> for my office. Which actually we were talking about. So yeah, so if if you're listening to the audio-only version of this show, like most listeners, um, I encourage you to check out the closet <laughs> that Mark has put a whole office in. So it's got all of the things that an office has. It's got his office chair. It's got lighting it's got like bulletin boards and calendars um and it's even got a placard with yes. um his first like check that he got i guess for like independent work like, it wasn't like your first paycheck at like a regular job but yeah it's like content it's, creation content side creation. hustle kind of thing yeah um, and that's and uh, for super data science exactly. the website super data science full com. circle full circle um, um yeah, it's, it's, it was special. I think uh, I've talked to other podcasts before, but uh, I'm really into entrepreneurship. I've started five companies. This is my fifth one. Uh, uh, that sounds impressive, right? No, no. This is the first one I've made money on. <laughs> <laughs> I've made a lot of mistakes. And sometimes it's, it's even hard to get to the starting point because I mean, you've been in startups. So you know how hard it is. I've tried from small side hustles to like try large scale where we like interview for incubators and pitching. And uh, this, this is the one, the content creation is the one that, that stick that's been working and it was completely on accident um, doing the LinkedIn stuff. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is working. You've got a ton of followers on LinkedIn. You've got over 19,000, probably by the time this episode airs, you'll be pushing 20K. Uh, and crossed. that is, yeah, super impressive. The content creation is definitely working. And so that's actually how I know you. I often tell listeners how I know our guests. And in your case, it was over a year ago, not long after I became a host of the Super Data Science podcast, someone at the superdatascience.com company, which actually <laughs> is a separate entity, um, but we have a similar lineage. And so sometimes there's overlap. And as regular listeners will know, superdatascience.com is a frequent sponsor of the Super Data Science podcast. But uh, somebody reached out from superdatascience.com and said, we've got this great new instructor, Mark Freeman. He's actually interested in being on the podcast. And so I put you down on my short list of potential speakers and was just waiting for the right time. And now it's the right time. Here, here we go. Uh, it, it really just kind of show like you never know who's who's watching when you're doing your content stuff, especially what, a year ago, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't anything around 5K. If anything, I was still really early. Oh, wow. That really? was very, yeah, maybe 10K. Either way, it was, it was still very early in the content, content journey. Um, and I think I was telling you earlier, like many times when I, I have people reach out to collaborate for, for content, for fun data science things, they'll be like, yeah, I've been watching for a while and they've never engaged with my content. <laughs> <laughs> they just show up one day and they've, they've been, uh, they've been watching for a while. So, 
Uh, yeah. You know, just, just show up for yourself and soon enough, sh- other people will show up for you too. Yeah, that's a really good point. There are certainly, if you think about, so when you make a post on LinkedIn, and actually I bet most listeners haven't made a post on LinkedIn because I can't remember the exact stat, but it recently came across my screen how that, that is a really small percentage of people to make LinkedIn posts at all. Mm-hmm. So maybe you haven't, but if you do, then you can see how many impressions the post has, ha- has had in real time. And you compare that with the people have, who have reacted or commented, and it's a small fraction. It can be like, some posts it's like 100 to 1, the number of views relative to reactions. And so yeah, there definitely a lot of, are a lot of people out there just watching. <laughs> yeah. Creeping. And sometimes they're your, like people you know really well. Like I'll be at like a dinner party or something and somebody will be like talking about like the specifics of some post and like, oh yeah, I read everything you write. And I'm like, you do? <laughs> you have never reacted ever. That happens at my job all the time. They're like, I really liked your post. I'm like, I didn't even know you saw this. <laughs> you really liked it, but you didn't actually like it. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, but yeah, I create so, content for everyone, everyone, even if you like or comment, which is preferred, <laughs> but, uh, you know, either way I'm creating content to teach people. And I share am ideas. only creating content for reactors. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else go away. I don't even yeah. want your views. No, please. I want your views. I'm so needy. <laughs> um, so, uh, so tell us a little bit about that. We, uh, tell us a bit about this content creation. Like what kind of content are you creating that's attracting so many followers? Uh, how'd you get started on that? Yeah, so I'm, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, during the pandemic was laid off about two years ago. And that sounds really sad, but it ended up being one of the best things ever to happen. And I kind of had this wild idea of like, applying to data science jobs is not a fun process. Uh, you go send your application out to the void and like you get no response. So I was like, you know what? Let's especially let's this. At that time. Yeah. Uh, I was like, I'm going to have jobs apply to me. And so <laughs> instead of me going out, I was like, I'm going to create one piece of LinkedIn content that provides value to at least one person every single day. And I created this hashtag called the layoff hustle, where I documented from day one, I was laid off to the day I got my next job to show oh. people how they can do it. And uh, my thought process was using the ADA model, which is a sales funnel, awareness, interest, desire, action. And awareness is that that content piece. Make people aware that you're looking for a job and you have these data science skills. And then the interest, desire, action is like the interview steps. Um, but that strategy worked and it's, it made me see the power of LinkedIn. And that encouraged me to keep on posting. So I started posting maybe like once a week, three times a week. And now I post Monday through Friday. Um, and it's been a really wild ride. And what happens is because you're post and people are aware of you all the time, they're like, oh, Mark could be someone cool to, to collaborate with. And so some of my favorite projects are uh, people come up to me like, hey, we want to do X, Y, Z. Um, you know, can you use our product to like, um, like our, their open source tool or something like that to create like a, a fun project. And because I love data science, I'm already doing these fun projects for fun <laughs> <laughs> already. So I'm like, yeah, of course, like, cool. I get some cool data. Um, to, to work with or teach people I couldn't reach before. Um, and it, it turns into these really cool opportunities and it's been running with it. Cool. Well, congrats. I love that you started doing it, that you had this, uh, not just silver lining to being laid off, but actually something that's accelerated your career, not only as a content creator, but also as a data scientist. To wit, um, you're working at a company called Humu now. So Humu is a startup that combines science and machine learning to enable people to grow into better leaders, better managers, or better teammates. How does the Humu technology work? And what's your role there? Definitely. And, and really quick to tie it back to like the content creation. Um, if you're around the fence about just posting on LinkedIn, do it. Because the reason why I'm able to grow so much in my current job at Humu is because I've built up this network of basically, I, I call my followers basically mentors. <laughs> I have 20,000 mentors basically teaching me all the things they've learned. I go talk to them all the time, whether in LinkedIn chats or calls or podcasts, and I bring it back to my job to solve some really fun problems. And so the problems we try to solve at Humu, um, basically the way it was pitched to me two years ago was 
building AI to make people happy, which is a great thing to feel great about. <laughs> but um, the reality of it is essentially just diving in. Um, there's these things called nudges and um, a lot of behavioral economics around it essentially is that there are many interventions to push people towards better behaviors. And one of the best places for behavior change is in the workplace. People are at work all the time. It's the main institutional thing. Mm -hmm. And so the question then is, is like, how can we push people to enjoy their work? Whether it's creating a more inclusive work environment, having a manager that's phenomenal, right? Um, giving them the data to understand what to do and then tying that information into actionable insights or actionable advice through our nudges that appears there via email, Slack, or Microsoft Teams, wherever your platform is. And so it's a really cool data problem because you have a whole list of advice, a whole list of people with different, uh, different attributes. How do you match the right advice at the right time to the right person? It's a super fun data problem to work on. And so my role, um, being in a startup, um, when I joined, the company's around 50 people, and now we're around like 130, 150. So it's like completely different. <laughs> Our data science team was small and mighty. So I've done a little bit of everything um, from, you know, building NLP models, uh, or let me phrase that, <laughs> not building a full NLP model, but taking existing NLP models and putting into production for, um, for our product, right? To doing product analytics, understand which product direction we go. And now, like, I've just been diving into data engineering as a data scientist, and it's it's been super fun. This episode is brought to you by Super Data Science, our online membership platform for learning data science at any level. Yes, the platform is called Super Data Science. It's the namesake of this very podcast. In the platform, you'll discover all of our 50 plus courses, which together provide over 300 hours of content, with new courses being added on average once per month. All of that and more you get as part of your membership at Super Data Science. So don't hold off. Sign up today at www.superdatascience.com. Secure your membership and take your data science skills to the next level. Yeah, so you do work as a senior data scientist with, an, at least on LinkedIn, what it says is senior data scientist, open bracket, data engineering, close bracket. <laughs> and you've been doing that since April. And prior to that, you spent six months as a senior data scientist without <laughs> the data engineering in brackets. So um, for our listeners who don't know, what is data engineering and how did your role change there when you had the parentheses added on? Definitely. So I think, you know, there wasn't a really a, like an official title change. I just talked to my manager. I was like, hey, I've been doing nothing but data engineering for the past six months. Uh, let's just change the title because it just makes it easier for me when I'm creating content or trying to network with people. Uh, mm -hmm. It just makes it easier for me to like have that common language and, and talk about things because, uh, you know, me going to some in mail um, for, for, for a data engineer, like, why is this data science talking to me? <laughs> um, even though most data people are nice, but this, this helps, uh, kind of like provide contextualization of like the work I'm doing as a data scientist. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and can you repeat your question again? I, I, I lost track of it. Yeah. Uh, how's my role different from data science to, to this? Yeah. Now that you have the parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that, yeah, when I work in startups, titles are kind of like, wishy-washy in startups you just show up where you provide value and it just so happens that data engineering has been that and so i guess like kind of a story of like how do i even start going towards data engineering yeah and, um, and what is data engineering yeah so what is data engineering that is a great question and i am still trying to learn that as well because i'm a data <laughs> scientist coming to data engineering and so i don't want to talk as if like i know all these answers for this new space i'm still learning um but I would argue data engineering um, is the process of preparing data and organizing data within an organization, um, specifically to drive value, whether it's a product or internal metrics. And so data engineering kind of expands across the whole data life cycle, which is um, kind of overwhelming how much they touch. But I mean, they're the ones really thinking critically of like, how should data flow within our system um, reliably? And with mm -hmm. scalability in mind. And so exactly. uh, I would love to plug uh, Ternary Data, Joe Reyes, Matt, Matt Housley, because they have been um, 
really integral with their both their content and also just talking one on one on on LinkedIn um, to really help me transition and answer a lot of my questions early in my journey. And so uh, I would definitely refer to them if you want a real definition because they really thought about that. Um, but that's how yeah, I currently we, view it. We might have to see if they want to be on the show. <laughs> Man, that's, that, that would be awesome. You should definitely reach out to them. Uh, and I'm happy to make an introduction if you don't know them already. Look Just out, listener, know. for a future episode with Joe Reyes and uh, Matt Hasley. Uh, they've been they've been on my radar for a while, so yeah, maybe we yeah. Can, uh, they, they just have the the book coming out for O'Reilly, the the data engineering book. So they, out of all people, they would know the definition pretty well. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> sounds like but, I mean, it sounds like a perfect episode. I think it. I think it is. I will. I would love to listen to that. Um, but uh, for this episode, <laughs> oh, it's unfortunately I'm not as amazing as them. Uh, but essentially, uh, kind of how I got into that is if you ever worked in a startup, uh, many times you just have to wear hats, many different hats just to get things done. Um, you're building the infrastructure as you go. Um, things aren't clear of like what's exactly needed. And so it's a lot of iterating really fast. And so in my role, and this is about a year and a half ago, uh, what kicked off me being obsessed with data engineering, I was asked to help the VP of product understand what's happening with one of our product surfaces like, why is it performing the way it is? And it was supposed to be a really easy question to answer. It, should, it was scoped for five hours. It took me 20 hours <laughs> to source the data, to identify what was the correct business logic, how it flowed through a system, and then prepare the data before I even did the analysis. And then I also realized all my colleagues were doing this for every single analysis, every single time. And I'm like, this is horrible because we're all doing different logic, we're all doing different kind of approaches, like, and it's just mind-numbingly hard. <laughs> um, even though data uh, data cleaning is a large part of of data science, um, the cleaning wasn't the hard part. It was actually understanding where in the code base did this data derive from, and how was it transformed in our product, so that way our analysis matches what's seen in the product. And for me, I was like, I want to fix this. <laughs> this shouldn't happen again. And that's how I kind of got into it. I, I started really going around the, uh, the company asking like, how to use data, what's working, what's not working, what do you wish you have? I asked, and we're a 50 person company at that time, so it's easy to ask the whole company <laughs> and do these little roadshow interviews. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot and from, from there, um, started really diving into our data warehouse, trying to think critically of like, how can we improve data access throughout the entire organization? How can we create data models that are easier for data scientists to, um, answer the questions they're asked. And more importantly is how can I make it possible for people to self-service their data needs outside of data science? Um, and through that, you know, I started creating all these projects. I started getting traction and I want to go more further and further upstream of like, all right, how's this data sourced? How can I create my own ETL pipelines? How can I fix ETL pipelines? How can I add data sources that's missing? And I just haven't been able to stop since. And I, I love it so much. Uh, and, cool. and you know, some people call me a data engineer with the company, but I'm not necessarily ready to take on that title because <laughs> maybe uh, someday. I still, maybe someday, but I feel like I have so much to learn. You, but, can, you can have an intermediate step where you're a data engineer, open bracket, senior data scientist, close bracket. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the core, core kind of theme through all this is that I have an amazing manager who saw me want to go into data engineering. And she just kept on teeing up opportunities. Or when I asked, she's like, yeah, go for it. Um, and making it very clear where the business impact would be at so I can both learn, but also still drive impact at the same time. So cool. All right. So that gives us a great sense of how you got obsessed with data engineering and now have more and more of it in your role as the senior data scientist. But tell us about the transition before that from just, it doesn't say junior data scientist, but just regular common data scientist to now a senior data scientist. So you were at Humu for a bit over a year uh, yep. as a data scientist before you were promoted to a senior data scientist. So is there at Humu like a strict definition of what the difference is between those two levels of seniority? And how did you pull it off? What was involved in getting that promotion? Definitely. So another quirk of startups is that they're typically very flat. They don't try to implement levels too quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at least for the startups I've been at. But when I joined, that was when they were, uh, I think it was probably, I think that was year three or four. 
uh, of, of the company. And they're like, all right, we're at a point where we need to implement levels. And so um, I just had correct timing where uh, where senior data scientists made sense. And um, one thing about working at Humu, I work with like behavior economics kind of thing and making work better. Um, there's a field called IO psychology. And a lot of my colleagues... Um, Industrial and data science, organizational psychology. Yes. Not input-output um, psychology. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... So uh, the data science team fits within the people science team, which is like the IO psychologist, right? And so because we have all this amazing like expertise, so like PhDs and masters who like devoted their life to like understanding workforces, um, they also create our levels. <laughs> they also create our interview processes. And so uh, my manager, uh, and I've been asking her to share it more publicly. I wish one day I'll convince her of uh, she created this whole leveling system for different tracks on the data science team, whether it's uh, you know, what's what's the qualities of a junior data scientist versus a regular data scientist versus a senior staff, right? Um, what does this track look like if you want to be an IC in analytics, an IC in product, or maybe you want to go down the manager path? Contributor. Yes, sorry for adding all the acronyms. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> um, but the amount of thought she put into it and she did like a whole literature review on like what this means and talk to other other leaders uh there cool. is a very big distinction at least at our company but that may not yeah. be the case for every single company i think we're just at a unique environment where we just have the expertise to really think about this properly yeah. um and so they're going to leverage that um and so my manager was able to very clearly articulate what were the things i was missing to make the jump to senior data scientists and such as one, such as, and I think I think the key thing was moving away from being task based to actually coming up and um, organizing your own projects, yeah, uh, creating a plan, delivering on projects, but more importantly, choosing projects that moves the needle forward for a business metric. And so that's the the key difference. And so it was a strange transition because when I first started my career, um, you know, you're given a ticket. And your work output is basically defined by your manager, whoever's in charge of like triaging the tickets. And the more work you do, the better. <laughs> but when you're trying to make that jump to actually being on the senior level, the more work you do is actually bad <laughs> uh, because you're just going to be burned out because, <laughs> because, <laughs> hear me out, hear me out. <laughs> because <laughs> here's the thing once you get to the senior level, you have the option to work on anything, especially as a startup. So, you can be working on a lot of stuff and burn out. You can be right. working on a lot of things that are the wrong thing to focus on. So you'll always you were, be busy. I thought you were going to say, now that I'm a senior data scientist, I get to spend all my time on the beach. That's just outside my apartment. Yeah. Rest, <laughs> rest, invest all day. <laughs> For the record, I'm not resting, investing. Humu. Uh, <laughs> no, he's in the closet all day, toiling away. <laughs> uh, but that was a key distinction. So like when, when I ma- was trying to make that jump, I was really tired and almost burning out because I was trying to do everything. And my manager was able to say like, Hey, Mark, you're doing a lot, which is great, but like, you need to prioritize better. You need to understand what's going to be the high ticket things and know when to take something off. Um, and so I really worked on that skill with her. Um, and as I said earlier, one of that big projects was increasing data access within the company. So that was the project where I was able to identify an opportunity that drove the needle forward, was a strategic initiative, and was something I kind of scoped out myself and was leading the charge on. And more specifically, thinking about like the strategy side of it, and I would love to give a big shout out to Devin Vashista, um, who does this uh, business strategy for data science course, um, whom who paid for me to do that. And it completely changed the way how I approach data science. And I think that was a really oh, key cool. moment for me to to shifting from that junior to like senior level because what from that, that course class, called again um it was um for the business strategy for data scientists i believe um and oh. i can find the exact title and send it to you um yeah that'd be great we'll put it in the show that. notes yeah yeah it was it was really transformational for me and so what that did for me it was like where would data science drive the most impact for a business and that shift allowed me to think more like a senior data scientist and so before I'd be like, well, I just need to do a whole bunch of analyses. 
just answer a bunch of questions <laughs> for the sake of doing data, or like build a model or like put out a bunch of PRs, right? After that course, I was like, I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> um, I took a step back and I thought, where in our value stream, kind of like how we're providing value to our customers from our products to our uh, customers, right? And customers are the one that's paying. We're doing enterprise kind of kind of sales for these things. Um, where is money coming in? And then from there, in that process, what's really high touch that's really hard to do that data and AI can't touch, right? Mm. And for me, I was like, customer success. They're the individuals after sales, taking a customer and guiding them along um, the journey uh, to make sure they're happy, but also they resolve issues and they're in charge of something very important, preventing churn and adding expansions for it. And so um, the other option was sales. But as a data scientist for sales, they are bef- the customer is before they come in. So there's less data on them. But customer success are existing customers. So we have all their sales data plus the customer success data and all their product data. So there's more data. They're in charge of this, this, this business metric of expansions and churns. And they're doing high-touch customer engagements. Therefore, through Vin's class, I thought, I need to empower customer success to be rock stars through data and their meetings. How can I do that? What are the questions they're trying to answer with data that they can't right now? And how can I automate as much as possible with data just to make them show up to every meeting and seem so informed? And uh, that was the key project that really pushed me to the senior data science level and was a huge shift in how I thought about approaching data science to drive impact. Amazing. That was such a an excellent specific example of what it took you to transition from a common data scientist to a senior data scientist. And I think you did touch on a lot of the key things that I look for in similar kinds of leveling exercises um, with people that work for me. That specific thing that you mentioned at the, at the beginning of your explanation about going from being somebody that takes tickets. So for those of you who aren't uh, software engineers or aren't involved in the tech space, there's this typical process within tech companies where you try to get the work that needs to be done onto these discrete tickets that indicate uh, you know, exactly what work needs to be done to make some change to the software code base or to develop some new machine learning model. Um, and the more discrete you could make those tickets, the better. And then you kind of, you want to have an estimate of how much time you think it's going to take. And Mark actually already alluded to that earlier um, with an example where he was talking about some ticket that was like scoped for five hours that took him 20. Um, so obviously the, the, the better your estimates um, of, of how complex the ticket is, the more easily you can project how long some big project deliverable um, or some product feature that requires lots of tickets um, is going to take. Um, and also there's another term, there's another, um, you used the term PR. Um, so so yeah. same thing, if you're not a software engineer already, that means pull request. And so this is uh, this means that you're, you've requested to integrate code that you've written um, with the code that everyone else has written. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, the changes that you've made um, to have that approved. Um, and so yeah, so and this, this, yeah, go ahead. I was about to say, and something I would like to add, because I'm still on this learning journey, and again, my managers already created these levels all the way up to the past staff, right? And so now I'm looking at, all right, what do I need to do to go to the next level? Do I want to go to the next level? My manager's in a lot of meetings. Do I want to have as many meetings as her? <laughs> and one thing I'm learning is like, and I don't, I don't think I'm trying to gun for a promotion for this next cycle. I'm really enjoying the senior space. <laughs> um, but one of the key things that she's been teaching me a lot is that difference between a senior and a staff I think it really comes down to influence within an organization. How can you clearly identify a problem or opportunity, create a strategy around why it's worthwhile to pursue, and then create the technical specs, create the whole um, kind of thought process and consistency and buy-in across the organization? Because when you're at this level, you're not working on little small tickets. You're working on like, I want to change the infrastructure of our tech stack. <laughs> and right. the implications of that are huge, right? right. Uh, both good and bad. <laughs> and so um, getting that buy-in is a very long process. It requires a lot of meetings, a lot of listening, a lot of feedback, give and take, 
and a lot of writing documents, <laughs> less coding and more thinking about the coding. Um, and I think that's the big difference I'm seeing at that staff level of being able to really do that and then delegate it to other people, not as a manager, but as a technical lead. Nice. Yeah, that's a really good explanation of the differences between senior and staff. Really cool, that level of influence and kind of the size of these big transformative projects um, yeah. that a staff uh, data scientist and is taking on. I'm learning it now. It's hard. It's so hard. My manager is really effective at it. And so I just like watch how she navigates on Slack. And I'm just like, mind blown. Wow, you're really crushing it. And I, I, I feel really lucky I get to learn from someone so talented. She sounds amazing. What's her name? Stephanie Tigner. Um, right. She is phenomenal. She's the head of data science and insights at Humu. Um, she has a PhD, I believe, in bio psychology. Sorry, Stephanie, if I got that wrong. Somewhere <laughs> in psychology, but she's super talented and is one of those per- individuals who's both a phenomenal leader, but also very technical. Where she like built an ML model like last week <laughs> for a POC, and like she can like dig into our code and be like change this, do this, you know, have you considered this? Uh, awesome. So it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, if you haven't worked in data science or technical role before, not all your managers will be technical. And, and there's different, there's pros and cons to that for sure. Uh, but definitely a huge plus of having a technical manager is being able to think critically about your work and, and, and collaborate. Sweet. So in summary, data scientists are task-based. They get given tickets by their managers and execute on them. Senior data scientists come up with their own work that has commercial impact. And then staff data scientists are doing big, game-changing, collaborative work across the organization that could mean, yeah, huge platform changes, huge um, model and approach changes, data flow changes um, that are going to have a big impact, hopefully for the better. Um, Definitely. Super cool. And that's that's definitely a generalization uh, within different companies, as you know, like, it can be completely different for titles and levels. Yeah, across but those, I think those is, is a general idea. I think that those are great. I, I yeah. agree with them. The, the awesome. way that we've defined them. I'm right. still learning myself, so it's it's cool to hear that other people um, kind of seeing this as well. Yeah. All right. So we have a sense of what Humu does. They're nudging people into the direction of having better workplace behaviors. Do you have a couple of examples of use cases where data science has an impact on that Humu mission? Definitely. Um, I think one of the, the key things is that, you know, we're taking science, you know, these best practices. We have all these amazing, smart psychologists uh, who know the theory really well, and we're applying it into, in a product form, right? And scaling that ability up. And mm-hmm. it, I really feel like I'm getting to impact people's lives that are positive. Um, mm-hmm. So it's really cool to show up to work and be like, I'm making a difference, make the world better. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the key things, though, because at the end of the day, we're still a business. People want to know, does it work? <laughs> um, you know, here's the science, this is theory. Does it work? And and time and time again, what's really cool with data science is that um, with our customers, we are able to take our product data. We're able to take, uh, sometimes the customers might ask for like specific analytics. They'll provide their business outcome data. And we're able to compare the, the impact of nudges and our product on the outcomes of employees and managers and their effectiveness on various business metrics. It's so cool. It's super fun to, to see kind of the analysis they do. Unfortunately, I can't go into detail um, yeah, about those things, but the ability of data science to really paint those clear stories um, through analyses um, and partner with customer success, partner with sales and marketing to really get these really effective data stories out there Um, And I haven't necessarily been working on this this much. All my colleagues who are amazing do this um, because I've been focused on data engineering. I'm trying to get the data for them to do these cool things. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I see in our meetings, they talk about it. I'm just always amazed um, by what they do, the research methodology they use. Um, They're doing some really cool statistics. Um, And then through that, we're able to pick up these patterns and we're like, all right, well, how do we build more product around that? We're seeing this this pattern happen. How do we operationalize that? You know, how do we, um, you know, build this blanking right now? But I'm trying to think. What can I share? <laughs> um, you know, uh, there's a blog on the NLP model. You know, um, how can we best identify 
for when when people take surveys um, for employees. Say, for instance, you have a thousand people. You're not going to read through a thousand comments. How do you determine which comments are meaningful for mm-hmm. understanding the pulse of your company? How do you determine which comments are um, negative or positive for a certain aspect that we told you that's changed recently for um, for your like wellness score or something like that? And it's making a word up, but you get the idea. Uh, so there's a really cool data problem that you can work with. Um, and being at a startup, you get to allow to iterate really quickly on this. Yeah. Ask a lot of questions, see what sticks, find that product market fit. And then from there, really build cool applications. That is cool, Mark. That was a great example. So whether you're wearing your senior data scientist hat or your uh, open bracket data engineer close bracket hat, um, <laughs> what, are the, what are the kinds of tools and techniques that you use day to day to make the magic happen? Um, you know, what's funny is that when I'm learning, when I learned data science, so much emphasis was like on ML, R, and Python, choose your poison. Um, but essentially SQL is where it's at. Mm. <laughs> SQL I use all the time. Um, I don't know if it's SQL, SQL, I call it SQL. But, uh, yeah, I feel like it can be a hot, hot topic debate right there if I wanted to. I have a little flame <laughs> war on LinkedIn. Um, but essentially, um, I use SQL so much in my job. And this actually came from my first data science role when I was at Veron Health. So before Humu, um, what I found was we, ha- we were working with massive data sets, um, billions of records. <laughs> uh, we're using Spark for it, right? And so I'm excited. I'm a new data scientist. I want to use Spark. I want to use Python. And I'm doing my analyses and it's taking me twice as long to do all my work compared to my colleagues. I'm like, what's up? What's happening? I I feel like I'm writing pretty solid code. Well, while I was waiting for my Spark and EC2 instance to to try to chug along, um, they're all using uh, SQL and Athena and working two times as fast um, because their code just just spit out the answers right away instead of waiting for their code. And that was the moment I was like, I need to learn SQL. I need to get good at this because if I can do as much work as possible in SQL and just preparing my data and getting my data out there um, and then going into an environment, whether it be Python or R or whatever it may be, mm-hmm. um, it's going to be really powerful. And so going back to Humu, um, we use BigQuery. We're a GCP company. Um, and I absolutely love BigQuery. I think it's one of the coolest tools ever. Yeah. Um, we use <laughs> they, it too. I love it. Yeah, I it's so powerful what you can can do with it. Um and here's the thing is that they literally have thousands of people <laughs> and billions of dollars being pumped into this to make it run well. Whatever they create it will outperform whatever script I create in 30 minutes. <laughs> and so that's why I go to SQL uh a lot and these managed services uh for that. Yeah. So I use SQL a lot. Um, for analyses, so just to just to quickly dig into a couple of ideas yeah. there before you move on to the next one is that so with Google BigQuery, um, in case this wasn't obvious to listeners, it is a SQL like language. So the syntax is very similar. If you already know SQL, doing Google BigQueries will be very easy for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but this the managed service that they provide allows you to use those SQL like queries on massive massive databases really efficiently. And yeah, so we use Google BigQuery as well, and I love it. We're also a GCP company, so you're, that's going to be my bias. <laughs> yeah, it, just so people know, like that is like that is the cloud provider that I use the most, and that we made the decision to use um, a while ago. Uh, so I support that. You also mentioned when you were talking about in your previous company, um, when you were talking about uh, your colleagues using SQL, you talked about them using something called Athena. That isn't something I've heard of before. So that's something that allows um, SQL queries to be scaled up to very large data sets. So it's been a while, uh, and please, please double check, um, listener. <laughs> but to my understanding, Athena allows you. So there's Athena and there's Redshift. Um, these mm-hmm. are AWS kind of services. Uh, right, Redshift's right, a typical right, right. data warehouse. To my understanding, Athena allows you to query directly on top of your data lake. Um, and so to reference that rather than going directly into the data warehouse. That is my understanding from three years ago. <laughs> Cool. All right. Uh, that sounds great. All right. So I interrupted you. You were talking about data retrieval and then you were going to move on to analysis, I think. So essentially, you know, we, we get this data ready in SQL. 
Um, we create all these kind of data assets uh, with using using SQL. Um, from there, I bring it into either R. So we use R for a lot of our analytics. Um, honestly, I think R is probably one of the best for statistics and the type of analyses we're doing, we're doing a lot of observational studies, mm-hmm. uh, especially like multi-level modeling. Um, mm-hmm. R is going to oh, yeah. be a R is the best for, for multi-level that. modeling. Yeah. 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 And if you think about the reason why we're doing multi-level modeling is like, um, you're working about workforces, you have different departments, different teams or different locations. Multi-level modeling really handles that very well. Yeah. It's a technique that we have talked about recently on the show. Um, so we talked about it in last week's guest episode in episode 585, Thomas Wiki. We also talked about in that episode, we were talking about using, using Bayesian statistics um, with the PyMC library um, mm-hmm. to have hierarchical models. But um, if you're not doing Bayesian statistics, then certainly R is, and maybe even if, maybe even if you are doing Bayesian statistics, which is relatively rare, um, R is the place to do it. And that is actually... That is how I really got into R in the first place because prior to R, I was using MATLAB mostly for my analysis. Mm. And it was Andrew Gelman and Jennifer Hill's book um, called something like <laughs> multi-level slash hierarchical regression models in R. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of names for it. <laughs> yeah, but that, so yeah, you know that book. It's like the Bible in this space the R hierarchical modeling space. And yeah. I'm super excited at the time of recording. Um, so by the time that l- you get to listen to this listener, I will have had the opportunity to meet both Andrew Gelman and Jennifer Hill in person at a conference, the New York That's Art awesome. Conference, which at the time of recording is in the future, but at the time of listening is in the past. <laughs> Amazing. And also for, for, for the listeners of like, if you're like multi-level modeling, what, what is that? Why, why would I use that? Oh, I yeah. think multi-level models, um, one, they're, they're still confusing to me because <laughs> they're one of those things where you have to keep on trying over and over again. It's not like riding a bike. I feel like I forget it <laughs> if I don't, if I don't use it after a while. So I have to like review the literature. Um, cause I'm in, I'm in data engineering world now. I'm not doing the analytics as much, but it is one of my favorite models. Because I think it's a great way to uh, represent Simpson's paradox, where Simpson's paradox is the thought where you may think you have one trend um, going in a certain direction, mm. but when you uh, stratify into different groups, it's actually the trends going all in the opposite direction. And so mm. multi-level models specifically are really strong in handling that. Um, and so... Uh, you know, when that clicked for me in grad school, when I was first learning about this, I was just like, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah, really like great magic. example there of how it's so powerful. And so to kind of give a concrete example, a, a common thing that Andrew Gelman and Jennifer Hill do in their book, um, which for sure we'll have a link to in the show notes, is um, so they do a lot of political research. Mm-hmm. And so you can, with a hierarchical model, you can break up your your data into groups like regions. Um, So it could be school districts or it could be voting districts. And then you can have every single school district or every single voting district have their own little regression model, their own weights Mm -hmm. within this broader model. And the broader model can pool together the individual ones and so, yeah, it allows you to have this much more nuanced representation of what's going on that, as you point out, out Mark, can allow you, for example, to, uh, to avoid making the Simpsons paradox mistake. And um, it also, it, it just, it provides a lot more nuance and specificity to the model. So the, it means then that you can make predictions by school district or by voting district in that model, you don't have to just have your um, your aggregate country level model, mm-hmm. and so it has that that uh, that extra power. Definitely, and and I would give advice to any data scientist who wants to more move into like the analytics side of things. I would highly, highly encourage learning about observational studies and that the techniques used for that space, 
And the reason being is that, um, and this is more so going to like my, my healthcare kind of research background, but mm-hmm. uh, either have, you know, clinical trials or randomized mm-hmm. control trials where you control the mm-hmm. experiment, you control the data, and therefore you can control for a lot of the bias. Um, and there's various steps for that. But many times as data scientists, we don't control the data collection. Maybe you're doing A-B testing. There's a little bit of control there. But many times you're getting data from a product that's intended for something else, or you're getting a third-party data that's coming in to combine it together. And mm-hmm. so the secondary analyses that you're doing, observational studies are the way for me to like conceptualize and think through how to approach this and more importantly, reduce bias as much as possible um, to you know do causal inference. Cool. Yeah, that's just a really good tip. And I do also recommend understanding those kinds of concepts well. Um, you know, when you can be making causal inferences or not. Great point. All right, cool. So we've got a good sense of what Humu does, yeah. what you do oh, there. Going yeah. back, uh, just to yeah, take yeah, a step yeah. back to in addition, um, you know, that was the R side. I also use a lot of Python. I probably use Python more than R. Um, for, for my work, cause I'm on the en- more on the engineering side. And oh, so yeah. if I want to, you know, take the, the research or analytics and operationalize it and put it within a product, um, we're a Python based company. And so many times I won't be working with BigQuery to access the data. I'm actually accessing, accessing our data directly within the database. Um, mm-hmm. and from there, um, you know, building the various tools and I get to do the software engineering best practices, you know, not, uh, of you know, doing the unit tests, having classes, uh, making things modular, getting the code review thoroughly from the engineering team, um, and that's that's where I have the most fun at. I really enjoy that. Nice. It does sound like you are becoming more and more of a software engineer for sure. And so, <laughs> I understand that right now Humu is doing software engineer hiring, and yeah, this is. I've said this a dozen times on the episode, on the Super Data Science podcast before. But if you want to be super employable as any kind of role in data science, you know, data analyst, data scientist, if you want to be super employable, definitely that list of things that Mark just listed around unit tests, it was perfect. You should rewind and listen to it again. If you, if you want to be super employable, listen to that list and be making steps in the direction of being a software engineer, which could include being a data engineer or machine learning engineer. And you will have so many job opportunities as opposed to being just a pure data scientist who can only work once the data have already you know, been provided to them. Uh, and like being able to take your machine learning model and put that into production or being able to engineer the data flows into your machine learning model, um, that kind of defines machine learning engineering and data engineering respectively. Those are hugely valuable skills. And yeah, and then those can be a stepping stone to being a back end software engineer or a full stack developer. Um, and you can still use the data science background that you have um, in lots of ways. You know, you're, you'll be like a full stack data scientist, some people call that. Um, but yeah, there's just, we hear about this all the time on the show. Often our guests are doing data scientist hiring, but they are always hiring software engineers. Yeah, it's a hard role to fill. And also just some quick advice for people. Um, you know, how I learned this stuff. When I came into this job, I had a desire to do more software engineering stuff. I didn't have the skill set for it. And so my manager put me in a position to do these more engineering tasks and allowed me to stretch myself. And code reviews is where I learned how to do these software engineering best practices. I had really patient <laughs> and really kind and thoughtful mentors on the engineering side. Shout out, shout out Miriam. Um, she is amazing. <laughs> she she brought me a lot of code review on large projects um, to really essentially get me up to speed to write production level code and code reviews, both doing code reviews and getting code review. And so you may be asking yourself, I don't have this job yet. How do I even get get this practice? Um, I will learn Git. Learn Git. Learn how to create a, uh, a pull request on your own GitHub. And then go on LinkedIn, go into your network and be like, hey, you're a software engineer, you're a data engineer. I did this code. Can you do code review for me? Ask someone. Uh, And you'll find at least someone to say yes, provide feedback on your code, and then implement it. And so the next time you go into a job interview and you're like, you know, what's your experience? I did this whole side project 
oh, by the way, I even got code review from my network and implemented their feedback. Um, you're going to look amazing <laughs> to the hiring panel to show that type of initiative. And that, that'll really mimic the work uh, workflow. Super cool advice. Really great advice. And so, yeah, so to, to get to the point that I was starting to make, um, at Humu, you're hiring software engineers right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so I know that you have, obviously, you're a data scientist who's been hired there. Other data scientists have been hired there. Currently, at the time of recording, there aren't data scientist openings, but there are software engineering openings. Uh, do you want to tell us about what kinds of roles those are? Yeah. So we have uh, front end, uh, back end roles, um, and then we have kind of like data infrastructure roles as, as well. Um, all over and all levels of experience as well. Um, you know, I recently conducted cross cross team interviews and we have, you know, we have a role for zero to two years of experience. We really mean zero, um, you know, fresh out of a boot camp kind of thing, but also we have more, more senior roles as well, uh, for that. And, um, and I was telling you earlier, I think I honestly think you have one of the best engineering teams in the world. I may be biased because they just helped me out so much, but, um, the amount of talent that I see, you know, they have like 20 years of experience. Um, our head of engineering, uh, Sophie Alpert, was like on the React team for Facebook. And so they do a lot of React stuff. She's super talented. She solves all my problems. <laughs> um, and, and there's so many other people just like her um, on the team. But most importantly, they're willing to share their advice and really mentor you and help you grow. Uh, and that's the key part that's really important to me is like the amount of willingness they're able to really help you out in your career. And I really appreciate them for that. Cool. All right. So in the hiring that you guys do at Humu, I know that you often have input on who gets hired. What are the kinds of things that you look for in people that you recommend? Definitely. Um, I think the key thing, if I don't know you and you reach out to me, uh, asking for a job, I'm, I'm going to ignore it because <laughs> I, I, you didn't give me any information about what you can do, what was your interest in the role, just asking for a job. I see that often. And I think it's more so just a lack of knowledge. They don't know how to start the conversation per se. Um, I would argue, do your research on what roles exist. Do your research on what problems the company is trying to solve. And then when you message people, say like, hey, I see this exact role. I'm interested in this. Or maybe a role doesn't exist, but you say, I see this company doing these problems. Here's my previous experience. Here is um, how I can provide value. And most importantly, if I don't know you, if you provide your GitHub with a portfolio project, I will open it and I will review it. And many times when it's good, I don't care what your background is. If you can have a solid portfolio project, I will message that directly to my manager. I'm like, you have to check out this person. Um, here's this project. This is why it's awesome. Um, so those are the key things. That's a very high level thing. Um, but I'm happy to go into any other kind of specifics on the, cause I've done on the hiring process from, uh, technical screens to, um, the case study reviews to actual one-on-one -on -one reviews. I mean, I think that's a great answer. We have still have tons of other questions that we'd like to cover. So I think that that kind of yeah. is like your high level tip for people. If they're interested in applying to roles at Humu or elsewhere, Having a strong GitHub portfolio that you can point to, definitely a great tip, Mark. All right. So we've talked a lot about Humu and what you do there. Before Humu, you worked in three Bay Area health and wellness related startups, Verona Health, you already mentioned them earlier, and two other ones, Collective Health and Life Dojo. So what have you learned from startups that you couldn't have learned anywhere else? Man, that's a, that's a really <laughs> good question. Um, that I couldn't learn anywhere else. I think two yeah. things that really pop out to me. One yeah. is prioritization. Um, of course, you're going to have to prioritize for any job, but you really feel it in startups because it can literally change by the day. I've literally had projects where like you built all the requirements, we're ready to go. And the day of, we're like, actually, this new opportunity popped up and it's very important. So this project's completely done. We're going to put on ice for a while. Um, <laughs> And it's not like till a year later, I can bring it back up. Um, and so that happens and being okay with having a queue of tasks. So going from like that task base to impact base, I have whole, so many Jira tickets that are like months old and that's okay because they're in a queue to be like something worthwhile to do, but not right now. And yeah. being in communication with your manager or your team, I'm like, what's the priority? What's going to drive the needle forward? Um, 
and having that understanding of prioritization. So like people I would highly recommend talking to are product managers. Go find a product manager and learn how they are prioritizing product features, how they're thinking about opportunities and thinking about the the various tasks and keeping things on track. I think product managers are like masters at prioritization. So I I, I reached out to a whole bunch of like, how do you prioritize? Because I suck at this and I want to get better. Um, And then the second thing, I think this maybe might be like an early career mistake, but I would look at tech stacks or like see like a problem. And I would think to myself, like, why would someone code it this way? This makes no sense. Like, why would they do this? Um, and now that I've been here enough <laughs> in startups, I, I know now I'm probably doing the same thing. And someone's probably saying the same thing about me later on, is that you build for the situation you're in at that moment. As a startup, technical debt can be very useful. Um, you know, you don't have to build the perfect thing from, from the beginning. Uh, if you try to do that, that's actually a mistake because you don't know if it's valuable to the market. Mm -hmm. You don't know how long it will probably take or what it would take to maintain. There's too many unknowns. So instead of focusing on the minimal thing that needs to be done to show value and get more information to iterate on is way more important. And so sometimes quote unquote, best practices may not align to your situation. And it's actually more advantageous to take a, uh, take a calculated shortcut or a calculated kind of risk um, to move and get more information to iterate on later than to go full on in. And so once I realized that, I, I've had a lot more empathy for things I may see in the code base um, at any company. Nice. Super cool answer. I love that. Prioritization and building for the situation, not forever, are your two big takeaways from working in startups. Love it. All right. And then... Prior to getting involved in startups at all, you did a master's in community health and prevention research. So um, what drew you into that field? I'm guessing based on the kinds of things you've already talked about, it was making an impact. And then um, maybe you have more to tell us about the journey that that background plays in data science. Something that you already talked about earlier in the episode that I imagine plays in here is that idea of understanding the differences between um, observational studies and randomized control trials, being able to draw causal inferences, but uh, maybe there's something else as well. Yeah, uh, I was not planning on being a data scientist. This is a relatively recent thing. Um, I was going to be a doctor. I was very dead set on becoming a physician. Uh, you know, undergrad, I did. I took. I got my degree in sociology, but took all these pre med courses because I was like, I'm going to go into medicine. I like volunteered at free clinics, all these different things, and my master's was actually at Stanford Med. And I I specifically did that program to make me more competitive for when I applied to medical school. Mm. Well, when I got to grad school, I realized, wow, I really hate grad school. This is not for me. (laughs) (laughs) And even funnier is that I was in classes cross-listed with medical students. I was taking classes with medical students. I'm like, I'm at the dream school for, for medicine. And I'm just not enjoying it. I'm like, this is not the right fit for me. And I think I knew this a long time ago, but it was just hard because I was just like some cost fallacy. But I really came to terms with the fact that I actually didn't want to be a doctor. Um, and that's like a whole other other story. Um, and we can get on to another time. It message me on LinkedIn if you want to know why I don't want to be a doctor. <laughs> um, and in hindsight, with the, given the pandemic, I think that was the right choice because uh, all my friends are in residency right now, middle of the pandemic, and that's been a very hard time for them. Um, but what I did take was a public health modeling class. I learned stats and I learned R and I just became obsessed. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever on top of my grad school courses. I was spending like 20 hours outside of school, just learning this stuff. Cause I couldn't get enough of it. Um, cool. and more specifically, I saw the Mar IO, um, uh, YouTube video where they build a deep learning model to beat a super Mario level. I saw that oh, video. Oh, the Mario and, video. That's so good. I used to show that in the the very first deep learning courses that I ever taught. So around 2017, 2018, I loved showing that in my final class as an example of a completely different approach so that they were using a genetic algorithm to train mm-hmm. Mario to excel at, uh, well, to train an, a computer agent or, uh, to to learn how to control Mario and excel at the game. It's such a good video and I'll be sure to include it in the show notes. 
Yeah, uh, I saw that video and I was like, wait, you can do this with the computer? Um, <laughs> and I, from there, I was just more so thinking, wow, okay, I don't want to be a doctor. I still want to have social impact. I'm falling in love with coding and statistics. Um, but more importantly, being at Stanford, I'm in Silicon Valley. I'm obsessed with startups. I, I got I got to see what startups are like and kind of, kind of peel behind the curtain and see like, what it takes to do startups. And more importantly, I'm obsessed with the idea of how can I scale social change? As a doctor, I can only impact people one-on-one um, at a time, which is very powerful and needed, but mm-hmm. it just wasn't the right fit for me because I'm a systems thinker. And data science allowed me to itch that, like scratch, uh, scratch that itch. <laughs> um, <laughs> but essentially is where I get to, I got to do statistics. I got to code. I got to have social impact and I got to be at scale and work in tech. It just seems so perfect. And from there, um, I kind of not necessarily drop all my mentors, but none of my mentors at the time were doctors. Um, they didn't they had no idea what data science was. And I started that shift. Um, and it wasn't immediate. It took me a, a, a couple of years, including grad school and then additional year of uh, picking up a second job in analytics and um, and coding on the train to work uh, to really pick up the skills where I got my first data science job. Um, and I... I'm obsessed. I love it so much. It shows. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I love the impact that you're making with it. I already said this in episode number 573 with Dora Shin. Um, and she very politely just said, doctors are really valuable and I really appreciate their work. But I made the point then, the same kind of point you're making now, that there are organizations like 80,000 Hours that are dedicated to um, doing research to try to help you have the most impactful career. And one of the founders of 80,000 Hours was on this show last year in episode 497, Ben Todd. So if you wanna kind of have an episode about how to know the latest um, opinions on how you can make an impact um, in general, as well as specifically as a data scientist, and how to think about how you might want to optimally make the most impact in your career, then episode 497 is a great one to check out. But back to Doris, um, in episode four, in episode 573, in that episode, I brought up how 80,000 hours, their research hypothesis is that a lot of people think, if I want to make a big impact in the world, I want to be a doctor. Like you're like, doctors are helping people. But because there is in any given year, there's a set number of places in medical school. If you make the decision to become a doctor or not, somebody else who is also super qualified will take your place. And so on average, the average doctor is making the same amount of impact as other doctors and and you can't like really move the needle and make a big impact. So so, um, So by choosing to become a doctor, on average, your net impact is the same as if you had it <laughs> chosen yeah. to become a doctor. Um, whereas in other kinds of things, like coming up with the idea for Humu as a startup to be like, let's take these kinds of nudges, these behavioral changes that can make a big difference to the way that people work and the way that they lead and the way that they are as teammates. Let's take that idea, digitize it, use data science to have machine learning models, that maybe can even do things once we collect enough data, can do things that wouldn't have even been possible before we started collecting these data and building these machine learning models. And then all of a sudden you can scale up these nudges and be making impacts on millions of people all over the world, the way they feel in their jobs every week. And so as you know, a data scientist there or as the founder of that company, you're making a massive impact on the world. And so, yeah, so, so, I think, science, I think something that, that really highlights, I, I was talking to one of my colleagues um, who worked at FANG doing the IO psychology stuff and they're doing like people analytics and they're like, I'm making work better for literally the top 1% of workers. Like they're not a FANG company in tech as a software engineer, right? <laughs> like their life at work is pretty nice compared to the rest of the world, right? Uh, and so thinking about how you could take that product and take that same impact you have for a FANG company, but like, Say, for instance, I'm just making names up right now, but like a very large retailer uh, where you're making minimum wage, right? 
Um, and I've worked jobs like that. They're pretty hard, especially you have pretty bad managers and that, and that, you know, you may not have the choice to leave that job, but what if we had a way to improve that work experience for everyone? Um, and take off that cognitive burden, that cognitive load where people are able to, you know, at least not have their job be hard for them um, at a personal level. And so the ability to take a product and scale it for the masses, that's why I'm obsessed with startups um, because they figure out a systematic way to take a novel idea and apply it to as many people as possible. Yep, love it. Yeah, these are, we're touching on a lot of the most impactful career choices you can make. Data scientist, software engineer, startup founder, and AI safety researcher is 80,000 hours number one uh, pick. And you can hear a lot about that, uh, not only in the Ben Todd episode, uh, which was, as I said, uh, 497, um, but also in a more recent episode with Jeremy Harris, 565, we talk a lot about artificial general intelligence in there and how AI safety research could be critical to uh, preventing humans from being wiped out by machines. <laughs> um, so super cool. So glad that you brought that up, Mark. Um, in addition to this kind of topic that we've just been talking about making an impact, this question probably isn't going to be a big surprise for you or the audience, but you've volunteered in civil rights organizations, health advisory committees, you've interned in a pediatrics advisory program, and more recently, you've been mentoring entry-level data scientists. So it's clear that you have a mission to help the broader community through data, especially the most marginalized people. So what motivates you to be doing all this? Um, there's a lot of factors in this. Uh, I think keep in mind, I come from a community health background. But I think the most core kind of component that really just resonates with me is uh, my dad was on a board of a nonprofit. And so growing up, I would always go to those nonprofit meetings because he had to watch me. So I just basically grew up in a nonprofit boardroom wow. <laughs> um, watching. And more importantly, as, as a person of color, I saw people of color in power making pivotal changes in my community um and and for context you probably you can't see me on the podcast i'm <laughs> i'm black and mexican uh, the reason being that's important is that growing up especially in high school i got bullied a lot for and i received a lot of racism um which is very unfortunate um and so having that juxtaposition of like outside of this getting receiving racism saying like, i couldn't achieve what i want to achieve because of the color of my skin to see the complete opposite and people make change at a systematic level uh, specifically for the nonprofit he was helping advise was uh, they did down payment assistance for first-time home buyers for families to improve wow. property ownership wow. um, which was really cool and so I grew up seeing them at a leadership level and so one that made it so that I knew it was possible for me to have impact and just be aware that there, there are ways to impact at a systematic level um, the second thing is um, you know, both my parents didn't graduate from college and especially my mom, she had a very hard upbringing. Um, and so she made sure I was made sure I was very grounded and being aware of like the challenges people face and exposing me to various people. And so one of the key things I noticed between like, how did I end up graduating from college, being able to transfer from community college where my same friends in community college didn't, um, they didn't have a support system. My parents made sure they, they encouraged me to make it through and make it to the next level and achieve my dreams. My mom was very adamant about that because she didn't have the opportunity. Um, my friends who didn't, who got kind of got caught up in the systems, they they didn't have that support. And so combining that, knowing it's possible, knowing that a blocker to that is the lack of support, um, it just made me obsess of like, how can I build systems to reduce the barriers for people to pursue a, a well-meaning life? Um, and healthcare seemed like the obvious thing at first for a long time, especially community health. But as I've grown in my career, I, I see data as that thing to scale up that impact, um, to make sure my same friends <laughs> um, had that support as well. My mom, you know, similar to my mom, had that support. Um, and this just really stuck with me. That was a beautiful answer. I had no idea that was coming. And yeah, 
really a uh, wonderful answer and I can see why you are so hell bent <laughs> on understanding data, data engineering, hierarchical models, everything that you can because you're mission oriented. Um, I love that, Mark. I'm, so cool. I'm it's been great. literally crazy enough to think that I'm going to change the world. Um, and even if I don't, the fact that I keep on trying, I, I think that's something worth, worth living for and change the world for the better. That's, that's the, the key thing. I absolutely love it. Um, and then another way um, beyond uh, data and healthcare, another way that you are making an impact is with a decentralized autonomous organization, <laughs> uh, also known as a DAO. So you're a yeah. data science advisor to Charlie DAO, um, which is quote unquote, building web 3.0 things. <laughs> yep, very descriptive. So, <laughs> so what is Web 3.0? What interests you about it? And what do you do for Charlie Dow? Definitely. Uh, so first and foremost, shout out to Carlos Mercado. He's on LinkedIn. He uh, used to be a data scientist. He basically was like, he got obsessed with Web 3. He has an economics background. He quit his data science consulting job, went full time into Web 3. Um, he, uh, he wrote a book um, that's free to, to download. Uh, that kind of introduced me to, to blockchain and, and decentralization. Um, that's a whole bunch of buzzwords. Don't worry about it <laughs> for, for right now. I can explain, explain later. Just ride along with me here. Um, but I knew blockchain was going to be something important because I went to a conference in healthcare, um, uh, precision medicine conference where they talked about how blockchain can be used for EHRs. Um, and they have a bunch of professors. What's, what's an EHR? Uh, electronic health record. Um, gotcha. so. Uh, when you go to the doctor's office, the notes the doctors take. Um, and so uh, electronic health records are really important for data science and healthcare. <laughs> very, very important. And also for billing and whatnot. And um, managing those systems are very hard. It's a fractured data system. And so the argument they're making, the blockchain will provide a system to bring these silos together to help improve patient care. Um, so they have a bunch of cryptography and medical experts explaining. So that was... 2018 so i was like okay blockchain's this thing it's really cool i don't know when it's gonna when it's gonna happen but i'm paying attention um carlos came out with that book i read it he explained how how it can be helpful mainly not for the u.s um because the u.s we for the most part have a trustworthy uh financial system um regardless of <laughs> of your political leanings um you know compared to other countries who may not be able to even trust to put money into their bank. So um, the argument that he was making in his book was that uh, Web3 decentralization allows countries and members of society who do not have a trustworthy government to put and ma maintain their money to have a separate source. And that's a way for kind of uh, for well-being and like social impact in a way through that. So when I read that, my mission, German Miles, like, I need to go to this now. Um, <laughs> And I just started learning about it. Um, I joined DAO, the DAO, and the best way to describe a DAO is the Discord um, with a bunch of Web3 folks who are tied to a mission, and sometimes they have a bank account. Um, <laughs> our current one doesn't, but some do. Some of them have like millions of dollars. It's a Discord with a millions of dollars, and they do things with it, which is completely wild. So, you know, you have Discord's basically a uh, bank account, right? Um, and if this sounds all wishy-washy, it's because it is. <laughs> um, it 100% is. This is a relatively new space. People are really trying to figure it out um, with with cri uh, crypto of how can we use it to build tools um, for that. And so the reason why I was like, you know what, I want to spend time with Charlie Dow, a lot of my free time uh, dealing with this is one, I just found it really interesting. The same way I felt about data science and, and learning statistics, mm -hmm. I had the same curious obsession with Web3 and, and crypto and like how it work. How does it work technologically? How can you build tools on that to help people? Um, and more specifically, I got really into NFTs. NFTs may be a word that people are like, ugh, like, <laughs> who is this guy? Why is he talking about NFTs? There's a lot of hate for it. There's also a lot of love. It's very polarizing. Specifically, I got really into analyzing NFTs. I mm -hmm. think uh, Web3 and specifically blockchains, if you're a data professional, I think you absolutely need to get into blockchain. The reason being is that even if you don't care about crypto, it is one of the largest real world data sets that anyone can access and do things with. 
as a data professional, you you should be like dreaming of this opportunity and it's growing every single second. And so with that, you can do a lot of really cool analysis with behavior economics. You can do a lot of cool analysis. I'm currently doing a network analysis um, on NFT tra- transactions, um, specifically to track fraud. Um, and so, you know, you could build these really cool things. That's why I became obsessed with it. It's like you can build tools in a new space that's emerging. Um, you know, if it becomes the next big thing like the internet, great. You're there early. You know how to build for it. If not, you still have a lot of fun working with data, at least for me personally. <laughs> um, and so that's the reason why I kind of got obsessed with it. It's, it's for fun. Um, and it's, it's how I like to spend a lot of my free time. And so for Charlie Dow, um, I focus on uh, doing analytics, helping build the community um, any small way I can. And things about Dow is that it's one of those things where you can hop in and hop out. <laughs> um, I may have a few months where I'm like super into it. I'm like on it, like talking to people all the time. I may have some months where I, just, I post maybe once the entire month. Um, but you you maintain a community, you keep this momentum going to really just work on problems. And specifically for Charlie Dow, his goal was to get a bunch of crypto people, data scientists, and software engineers together and just have them talk about what if. What if we can build this? What if we could do that? And they're providing a whole wow. bunch of support to create an MVP. And then from there, potentially take things to the market. Um and so we've had one product, uh, Deep Freeze, uh, which is essentially like CD accounts. Um, it goes into fancy economics that I don't understand. But <laughs> they created a crypto protocol to essentially create CD accounts for your crypto. Um, and that's one of the big projects they worked on. They're specifically targeting uh, large institutions who want to reduce their risk. So even though they may get like a fraction of a penny, a fraction of a penny of a billion dollars is a lot. So, <laughs> um, you know, that's that's the thing they're going after. Um, other things is like NFT analytics dashboards. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff happening there. Um, and yeah, that's, it's so new. It's so new. And it's just a really fun space to be in. Um, if you can get kind of get past all the scams and pass all the hype. Um, if you look at the technology from a data professional lens, um, you'll be amazed at the opportunities there for you to grow your data skills. Cool. I can see why you're so excited about Charlie Dow. Sounds like they're doing fascinating things. And for those of you wondering what a CD account is, it's a common financial instrument in the U.S. It's called a certificate of deposit. And so it's kind of like putting money into a savings account, but you put it in for a fixed term. So you put it money, it has to be in the account for a year or two years. And then so because you're locking it in, you'll typically get a better interest rate than if you just put it into a savings account where you can take the money out anytime. Awesome. All right, Mark. What a cool episode. I love your energy and I've learned a ton from you. I've had a lot of fun being here. I really appreciate you uh, reaching out to, to join. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's I, a blast in your closet, Mark. It's been great for me. <laughs> I'm on your screen in your closet. Look at me. Yep. Um, <laughs> the podcasters um, are probably listening like, what? What is he talking about? <laughs> I, I just am. I'm right there. My virtual presence is in the closet. Pressed up against the wall with just Mark there. Um, yep. So, yeah, so we're getting near the end of the episode. Regular listeners will know that now is the time that I ask for a book recommendation. What have you got for us, Mark? So uh, I recently got to listen to Katie Milkman, um, who is, I believe, a researcher out of Warden um, on behavior change. Um, And she recently had a book come out called How to Change. How to Change, the science of getting from where you are to where you want to be. And so... I just ordered this book, so I'm still on the first chapter. But the reason why I'm okay recommending it is that I listened to her talk about the book, and she went into all her research and talking about us. Um, and it was phenomenal. It was exactly the challenges I was facing. And one of the key kind of things they're trying to get at is that behavior change is hard. But if you employ tactics to make the th- hard things fun, or group it up with certain ta- uh, certain skills or certain uh, behaviors that you already do well, you can really flip the cycle and really build habits to improve your life. And so as someone as a community health person, um, I'm really big into behavior change because that's core to, to health and well-being. That's why I learned from community health. And being at Humu, I get to learn about behavior change from these experts and learn how to put that into a product. Um, and so this book kind of like ties that all together for both my personal life 
my academic interests and then also just um, my, my job as well. Love it. All right. And then we've already mentioned that you have 20,000 followers almost at the time of recording, probably definitely by the time of uh, publishing this episode. And so lots of people like to get your daily tips on LinkedIn. Um, that's obviously, I assume, the main place where people should be following you. Where else can people follow you? I think LinkedIn's the the best place to reach me. I, like I said, I try to post Monday through Friday. And more importantly, the way I try to create my posts is a meeting ground for people who are learning just like me, or maybe on the beginning of the journey, I'm much further along in my journey now. Um, and then people who are way more experienced than me. Create content that piques interest of both sides to have conversations so we can all learn from each other. And so I highly encourage either just check out my content and just reading the responses people are saying, because they have some really talented people giving me great advice. Again, 20,000 mentors. Um, or you can ask your own questions. I'm happy to respond on those posts. And typically I talk about data science, what I'm currently learning at my job right now, um, maybe the challenges I face and mistakes I made. Um, and they're all there just all for us to learn together. Sweet. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, definitely follow Mark to get the latest uh, that's going on in his career. All the mistakes he's making. That's what I want you to read about. Um, They're great mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Only the best um, of mistakes. <laughs> sweet. All right, Mark. Thank you so much for being on the show. And we'll have to have you on again sometime. Check in, see how you're doing. That'd be great. Thanks for having me. What a fun episode today. I pretty much always have a really good time with guests, but Mark in particular was an absolute hoot and lots of meaty data science and software engineering knowledge to share with us. In today's episode, Mark filled us in on the ADA, attention, interest, desire, action model he uses to guide his catchy content creation. He talked about how Humu leverages data and machine learning to nudge people into the direction of more effective workplace behaviors how junior data scientists are task-based while senior data scientists come up with their own commercially impactful work, how he loves SQL, particularly Google BigQuery, for efficiently extracting the data he needs from a large database, how he loves hierarchical models in R for handling the nuance of subgroup data and avoiding Simpsons paradox, and how all data scientists should perhaps be interested in Web3 because of the massive amount of publicly available data stored on the blockchain. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Mark's LinkedIn profile, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 587. That's superdatascience.com slash 587. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana Siebert, Mario Pombo, Serge Massis, Sylvia Ogvang, and Carol Aramenko on the Super Data Science team for managing, editing, researching, summarizing, and producing another sensational episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.